Yeah. Yeah, we're just getting settled in here. Welcome friends online. Welcome friends here. So yeah, I'll give a slow but hopefully not rambling intro for us as folks are still heading in. I am Eve Ekman, really happy to be here with you all at the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, wonderful to see many familiar faces and some new faces here and online. This is an entirely volunteer run center, kind of an anomaly in this day and age to actually literally be held in a space that is created through generosity. Um, it's very interesting, you know, trying to bring yeah, like a living embodiment of the practices, which really are about interdependence to life and doing that in a um, pretty intensely capitalist structure that we live in in this country, but this city especially. So just really quite unique and special that we can be here together um, in this kind of context and uh, don't want to overstate, but, you know, living the dream you know, creating the reality we want to live in, right? One in which we are supporting each other. And um, tonight and every night, we will go through some of the text, some of the Dharma, but the purpose of being here together is, is Sangha. And though we can meditate on our own, and we can absolutely learn a lot on our own. And in fact, we really need to spend that time on our own to make the practices real for us. We have to be in community. It's it's so essential for these practices to come to life. And I think to really start to transform us. Partially, I think it's because community helps buoy us, right? To feel less alone. Partially, it's because we learn so much from hearing how others are interpreting and integrating the Dharma into their life. And then a part of it is unexplainable, kind of the magic of the fact that when you're meditating in a room with others, very often, not always, very often, your practice is better. And without a lot of explanation, you'll hear in the traditions, they say that it's much greater merit when you practice with other, like, it's like you get more points. <laughs> so whatever, whatever of those resonates for you, um, but explore it, there's just a different quality. And we're so fortunate to live in a time, I think it's actually YouTube, that is truly the number one meditation app not not headspace not calm but youtube a lot of people meditate on youtube and it's incredible right free access to hundreds of thousands of teachers alive and dead um what you don't get is sangha right access to really brilliant teachers but not that sense of community so quite special to be here together um tonight we will be continuing with this incredibly beautiful book, Old Path, White Clouds, this historical life of the Buddha compiled by the late great Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, just an inspiring story. And we did make it through the night of enlightenment. It took us a month, but <laughs> it was worth it. It was like 10 pages. It was so rich. And now we're into this phase I love in the book. I, I love it all. But it's, it's so interesting. So the Buddha has attained enlightenment. He spent this beautiful time um, in the natural world, supported by really this inner fire of understanding and clear seeing. And through that dedicated time of practice and um, really continuing to kind of part the veils, like what's behind it, what's behind it, what's behind my thoughts, what's behind my desires, what's behind all of the experience and phenomena of this present moment. He had this clear seeing and attained enlightenment in which he was able to see everything clearly, right? Seeing things as they truly are. And he does spend a couple of time, a couple, a, a little bit of time just hanging out. And it was nine hard years of deprivation and practice and often discouragement. And he gives himself a little time to just enjoy the fruits of that waking up. But very soon, as we'll see tonight, he takes his Dharma into the world as as we're meant to do, right? Even our little kernels of enlightenment that we experience, we share them with others so that they can be brought along with us. Um, so really happy to be here together and discussing how do we bring these teachings and our own realizations um, 
to the world? How can we share them with others? And how can we receive them from others? Um, this first, these first couple of weeks of the Buddha leaving the, you know, Nagarjuna River and the beautiful tree that was his abode and creating community. And the Sangha, it just starts popping up. And this is the part I find so amazing, you know, living in the time of the Buddha and you're just happen to be wandering through a forest and you run into an enlightened being and, oh my God, you know, first there's one, then there's like 500 and then the numbers just escalate. People run into the Buddha and what they experience is, oh my God, that's what I've been looking for. Of course, what he's saying, but more than anything, the presence and maybe you've also been in the presence of someone where their warmth or their joy or their just ability to like clearly see you're like, what, how can I, how can I access that? Um, so just really, I just really get excited thinking about that possibility of, you know, these encounters of all these different beings who meet the Buddha and they're like, I'm going to give everything up and join you. It seems so far away to me. And yet, I don't know. I think about if there was an opportunity to live in community, to practice that which would truly transform my life, that really pulled on that deep longing of knowing that we're not free. Maybe we would all give it up. Maybe I would give up what I what I have, the trappings of what I have. And there's a really key aspect of the, <clears throat> the teaching tonight in which we see one of his first, you know, one of the first people who becomes a disciple who's not his, his former community of practitioners is someone who he encounters in the woods who is experiencing revulsion, revulsion with the excess of their life. It's a very wealthy son of a merchant. And <clears throat> in his everyday life, he just sees that it's just just so much excess, you know, there's all these resources, but what does it actually lead to? You know, what does all these distractions and all these luxuries, you know, he finds himself kind of sickened with that. And it's interesting, but I, I do think, you know, my teacher, Jennifer Wellwood says this all the time that we need a little revulsion to help us along the spiritual path. We actually need to feel a little nauseated by the kind of cyclical nature of, ooh, I really want that thing. Ooh, God, I want that thing. Can't wait till I get that thing. We get that thing. Oh, where's the next thing? Right? We have to actually tire of that process a bit to inspire us on the path. And so in our meditation tonight, what I'm going to invite us to do is, is not exactly connect with disgust per se, but to connect with our sense of dis-ease, maybe low level despair. For most of us, that's right below the surface, right? If you looked at the news, you have at least 10 reasons, but to connect with that and to, as we often do, shake hands with that feeling. So the handshake practice of meeting our suffering <clears throat> plainly. We're not going to stay there. Um, again, in these early teachings that the Buddha is offering in his first months after awakening, one of the key aspects is how important that clear seeing is, like seeing and becoming nauseated or at least disenchanted by what doesn't serve us, but also looking deeply and clearly with wonder, with awe at the beauty of the world. And we do that with mindfulness. Right, just simply looking and noticing, free from our preoccupations of, can I get that? Do I want it? Is it mine? Just that clear looking, and all of a sudden, the beauty, the wonder, the awe is revealed to us. So we're going to kind of explore both of those tonight in our practice, starting off with that connecting with our feelings of overwhelm or despair or cynicism. And then moving towards just a awareness <clears throat> and simple mindfulness of our breath, our body, and this incredible world that we live in. So that's our <clears throat> that's our flight plan for you all. And I invite you to find a posture that is comfortable for you, one that you can have and hold maybe 20 to 30 minutes.
And we'll take a moment here and use this wonderful technique. I know I've shared before that I learned from His Holiness the Dalai Lama just watching him teach. And when he sits into his seat, he's often kind of leaning one way and then leaning the other, and he'll lean forward and back and like really find just where's that right spot where I have a sense of being upright. And then inviting ourselves to find an openness and a spaciousness in the chest by inhaling our shoulders up to our ears and then exhaling down our back. And twice more, inhaling up and squeezing and bringing our shoulder blades to touch so we can feel the chest open once more. And finding somewhere for the hands to rest on either on your knees or your thighs or folded in your lap and really taking notice, what does it feel like in the neck and shoulders? It's really helpful to have our hands placed in a way that we have the least tension or tightness around our neck and shoulders. Doing our beautiful mudra posture, posture of turning off our phone and also giving ourselves a moment to find our head just resting gently and evenly on top of our neck. And finding either eyes really gently closed or a soft gaze with them slightly open if that feels more comfortable. And whether the eyes are slightly open or closed, feel or imagine that the gaze is inward towards the heart. I'm taking a last moment for any adjustments before we ring the bell and begin. We may already be noticing the thoughts or feeling tone that's in our mind, maybe sensations moving through our body. Giving ourselves a couple moments here to just allow ourselves to settle. Feel or imagine our attention and energy descending. moving away from the thoughts, ideas, and images, and feeling our attention and awareness, just finding a home in the belly.
feel the sense of our body being supported by the ground beneath us. Of course, there's floorboards or rugs or cushions beneath us, but feel or imagine farther down to a sense of the actual earth beneath us. And feel or imagine the sense of incredible generosity of the earth, its willingness to hold us. And let that be an invitation to continue to release and relax our energy and attention downward. Through each exhale, imagine releasing a bit more of our mental activity down into the earth. Feeling a sense of stability and stillness from that support of the earth. Noticing our whole body as we breathe in. Noticing our whole body as we breathe out. to help us further settle the inner speech. Taking three slow, deep breaths and following the breath through the entire inhale and continuing to follow the breath through the exhale as though riding the full wave of our breath. Returning to the natural rhythm of the breath. And connecting to a sense of not only our breathing body, but our breathing body in space, in this place, in this moment. A sense of gathered together here with other beings. A sense of, of course, the roofs over our heads, but also a sense of the spaciousness of the sky above, 
now well into darkness, maybe clouds, maybe wind. Feeling this breathing body supported from below, held in space and vastness from above and around, and gently connected to other beings, breath by breath. Each breath helps us remember our interconnection. Each of us drawing in from a shared set of space. Each of us exhaling back out. So continuing to attend to the feeling of the breath in the whole body with that sense of curiosity and presence, each breath as connection. Our minds are so busy, often readying us for what might happen next, the next thought, the next plan. Consider the possibility that we might not know what happens at the end of an exhale. There's no assurance of the next inhale. So we can have a sense of our whole body readying itself for what is next. Receiving the next inhale, <clears throat> the next inhale so freshly. Softening, relaxing, and releasing through the muscles in the face. Inviting gentleness and ease through the chest. Relaxing and releasing through the belly. And 
Imagine a softening and relaxing through the hands. Couple more moments here, experiencing the whole body breathing. Doing so not from above, looking down on the body, imagining how the body feels. Feeling the body from within the body. Now that we may be slightly more present and grounded, consider our intention for being here this evening. The intention can be a single word or a phrase, something that helps connect us to our greater purpose. Collectively, inviting the intention, remembering that everything we do here is in order for us to get a little more awareness, openness, kindness, so that we can share that and be a little more aware, open, and kind to other beings. And then shifting our attention and awareness away from our intentions and aspirations. And while still maintaining a presence of being in this breathing body, we invite ourselves to turn towards and meet a real sense of what might be hard for us in the world. We don't have to think of anything specific, just considering the weight of the world as it is. Inviting ourselves to really take full measure of the experience of meeting the catastrophes and disasters, the myriad challenges of our social, political, economic, and ecological structures. And 
And really noticing and feeling any shifts or changes in the body as we openly meet and even welcome. In this shaking hands practice, the goal is to notice and feel the sensations associated with challenging emotions without trying to change them or fix them, but giving them all the space they need. Many of us often push away these worries, these concerns about the world. <clears throat> and that can be very healthy to do. The invitation here is to give us some space to really be with. And open to. The feelings, emotions, and thoughts and images that arise within the body, not trying to fix anything, not trying to analyze, meeting and making space, meeting and making space. Maybe many things arise, images of people we know dearly who are struggling, images of places in the world where there's great difficulty. Or maybe nothing in particular arises. Wherever we are, just making space, softening feeling a sense that our attention is kind, is curious, and we can be with the sensations in the body. If it becomes difficult or unpleasant at any time, you can gently open the eyes, and place the hands on the belly and focus on the breath. And otherwise, just gently notice as the sensations shift and change, as long as we don't re-trigger by thinking. Allowing the feelings to come to the surface, shift, change, release.
even amid what may be dense or difficult feelings. See if you can notice a sense of also a presence of something that is generally and genuinely okay. Maybe this feels like some sort of warmth at the chest. Maybe it just feels like spaciousness. So without trying to push away or deny anything that might still feel heavy or sticky, directing more of our attention towards a sense of okayness, a sense of goodness, this fundamental intrinsic nature that is always already okay. To support this feeling, we can allow our heart to be lifted through rejoicing. Bringing to mind a time in which we experienced a sense of rejoicing with the natural world. Maybe it was seeing the sun through the clouds today. Maybe the wonderful whipping of branches with the wind yesterday. giving your mind this, this lightness and this lift by rejoicing in beauty, maybe even a sense of wonder, this incredible natural world. Again, noticing how this may feel in the body. Maybe it moves and shifts around different qualities of sensations. For a couple more moments, holding some of these images in the mind vividly. Just enough power and force to get us going. So that we can feel that goodness in us.
Now releasing any concepts or images and returning to this beautiful, simple homecoming of the breath and the body. Breathing in, riding the wave of our breath with our attention and awareness. And breathing out, continuing to ride that wave through the exhale. Being the goodness, the okayness, breath by breath. Thank you for your practice. <clears throat> Before we shift into the next part of our time together, the reflection and discussion, a simple and gentle reminder for folks that everything we're doing here is our practice. So as we are meditating, that's probably the most obvious form. But as we're listening, and as we're sharing, we're doing so from a place of deep compassion. Such an incredibly difficult exercise, right, to truly imagine and kind of feel into um, the experience of other beings with kindness. We are so ready to kind of judge, imagine, predict, right? There's this idea that our mind is just a kind of prediction making um, model. What is it like to lean back into the compassion? Just feel, experience what is being said. Noticing that in the body, the same way we noticed our body through practice. Such a beautiful invitation. It's, it's so important for us here at the Dharma Collective that we try as best we can to have that compassion and deep respect for one another in what we share and um, how we share it. And that we're always eager to hear from folks about ways we can do that. And I am so grateful that somebody reached out uh, after our session last week um, and the board was kind enough to share with us that we did the Tonglen practice last week. And then we often do practices that are traditionally taught of bringing in light and moving with the darkness and the light. And yet those practices inadvertently can create a false binary between light as good and dark as bad. And that can reinforce a lot of paradigms and a sense of what's good and bad that is really unhelpful. So I think for Chandra and I, we uh, were discussing that early today is how do we break down and, and decolonize some of these ideas in our practice so that we really have a sense that it's an enriching experience. It's 
bringing the very best of what we are and who we are to the surface and not reinforcing biases. So it's just a such an incredible example of how hard it is for us to feel into and experience into all of our practices with this kind of awareness of non-harming. So hard, right? It's uh, the levels are mind boggling, non-harming at our inner speech level. Oh my God, good luck. Non-harming at our outer speech level. Yeah, good luck again, because your face counts. Sorry, not just your words, right? How can we be non-harming in all of our communication and action? So yeah, deeply appreciating um, that invitation that was shared with us and I'm happy to be able to share that with you all here too. So any questions or reflections on the practice before we get into uh, Buddha on his, on his path away from the tree and the river, his next part of the journey? Yes. And do you mind? Yes. Thank you. Um, that was, uh, when I came, I grow, which I never drive. And so I had this coming in here, I couldn't find parking and I was filled with anxiety about what I missed this, what, you know, and I'm thinking, I'm just wrapped up in this, you know, torrent of emotions about why can't I find parking? And um, then I get here and I'm a little bit late and settling in and um, I'm starting to get these kind of like hypnagogic sort of mm. images. I'm sort of like, I'm not falling asleep, but these very vivid images. Mm. And the idea of um, meeting the catastrophes, they're so, you know, they're, they're, they feel very abstract, but mm. they feel like I'm reading on the newspaper or something about Syria or about mm. Turkey or about Palestine or something. Mm -hmm. And it feels very abstract compared to my distress about not being able to find parking, <laughs> which felt so powerful and real. <laughs> and then I, when you moved into the thing about trying to connect with something good, I just had this profound sense that what, that I don't feel worthy of mm. this generous, good, you know, whatever, that there's all of these people that are in right. deeply impoverished and oppressed circumstances. And, mm. um, and I have all of this thing that I didn't, I'm not deserving of it. As far as I know, I didn't do anything to, you know, yeah. past lives or what. <laughs> I have no idea, yeah. but it's, so it just sort of felt like this. So it almost felt like I don't, it's uncomfortable to think about things that are good or okay, because it feels like I realize that doesn't take it away from somebody else, but it just sort of feels like what business do I have from focusing on yeah. well-being and all of the good stuff that I've got. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Can I, can I ask you a follow-up question? Absolutely. Where, so I really appreciate your description of that. I know you're not alone in that struggle of like trying to balance the suffering of the world and then how can we focus on our well-being i think that's so common and there's a it sounded to me which is really good that you were experiencing it like noticing how it was as a feeling uh -huh. right um i'm curious do you have like an intellectual answer to it so there's the feeling of maybe it was hard to feel the goodness but when you think Hmm, like, how can I focus on my okayness when others are not okay? Like, is there a rational response you have for yourself? Um, I think it's sort of like dates back to like, you know, when I wouldn't finish my meals as a kid and we got starving children right. someplace. Yeah. And so it sort of felt like that's it's really, um, it feels wrong. Yeah, that, that's a feeling sort yeah. of thing. And then from an intellectual sense, it feels um, it kind of doesn't make sense. I guess maybe the, the the worry is that if I get into it too much, then I will sort of feel like, oh, that other stuff is just a bummer. So yeah. I don't want to, yeah. you know, I'll just sort of be in a kind of hedonistic sort of just enjoy the fact that I can get, you know, a kombucha across the street yeah. and it's three dollars and right. you know whatever so i think that's kind of it it feels yeah. like a danger in a certain way yeah yeah does that answer yeah yeah Great. yeah thank you thank you i wish i could give you a perfect answer um 
but I, I will say that, yeah, and I think it's very, very meaningful to really feel into those edges of where it feels like if we allow ourselves to open into goodness, that there's a risk, that there's like a danger, you know, that if I do that, maybe I won't care about other suffering, right? Um, there's so many ways that we can kind of withhold goodness from ourselves yet, you know, and this was, you know, I'd say in the, in the most masterful way that that can be instructed, not necessarily what happened here tonight. It's not generating goodness. It's revealing what's already there. Right. And so it's not, um, yeah, it's not like, Oh, like, let me get a nice kombucha or let me think positively of myself. It's, let me tune into what's always already okay. And, and that actually, you know, that actually helps us in our ability day by day to be with the suffering, right? And, and that's the second part of it is, that's again, the kind of cliche, but very true is how can we fill another's cup if our own cup is empty? And yet for most of those, uh, most of us who have ever worked in frontline professions, it's like, I, I've never seen a full cup, right? It's like, what are you talking about? The cup has a hole in it. We're just pouring it out as it gets poured in. So it's, it's a really um, tough practice. And so interesting, because I, I do think, especially as we're reading about the historical life of the Buddha, that this this configuration of unworthiness is more prevalent in certain societies and cultures at certain times than others. And that's why, you know, you see this enormous interest in these practices of self-compassion um, in our contemporary culture. And especially since Buddhism has come to North America and, and many parts of the modern world. And, you know, it's, it's meeting this culture in which there's a so much emphasis on individual achievement and success and this kind of um, real intensity around being like, not just okay, but like really good, successful. Um, and it, it kind of undermines an ability to think like, maybe I'm already okay as I am. It's really hard to sell stuff to people if they're already okay. Right. Um, I'm not trying to throw capitalism under the bus every week, but it might happen. Um, and we can still, we can use capitalism for good purposes and we need to see it clearly. Right. And um, I think it, it really, it is, it's so powerful that when I was first introduced to this idea of basic goodness, as maybe many of you um, from Chogyam Trumpa and in his, um, the, uh, the sacred path of the warrior. The anyone know that his famous book, the spirit, the sacred path of the warrior. Anyway, Chogyam Trungpa. It's a such a beautiful book. A lot of it hits on the fact that if we can really calm down enough to just be with ourselves, we notice that there is like this tender, beautiful heart that's already there, and what a revelation that is. Um, and it's also a revelation to realize it's hard to get there. And yet I do think we are, we are experiencing our basic goodness often without trying, you know, a sense of okayness or basic goodness. Um, Sokni Rinpoche calls it essence love. And though I love those words, I think that feels even farther away. <laughs> like, what do you mean? Like, basically, okay, maybe. <laughs> uh, essentially love, like, not sure, right? Um, but uh, yeah. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Yeah. This distinction of the, it's the revealing of the goodness rather than like some goodness that's being given to us also touches in me that sometimes for me, it's really hard to receive goodness or kindness or love because I'm terrified that it's mm -hmm. going to be taken away. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm ready for that. And so if, if there's a real register, oh, I'm just revealing it. No one can fucking take that away. It's here, right? Already it's there. Like just been all covered up, right? It's like, so just that, I really appreciate that yeah. distinction. 
Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, there's such a good litany of reasons why we shouldn't receive love from others, right? They can take it away. Maybe they expect something from us. Uh, maybe it's conditional, right? It's, um, it is. And, you know, I, again, I, I've said this here before, I, I don't think it is required for us to love ourselves to be able to be or like to be compassionate to ourselves to be compassionate to others. I've seen many cases, myself included, where I deeply struggled with compassion and was able to give it to others. But it's not sustainable. You can't do that for very long. It just really um, exhausts us. So Noam, do I see a hand or comment online? Okay, great. Hi, Eve. Thank you so much for your practice yeah. and your teachings. Um, it, as I was listening, I was thinking I, I uh, helped facilitate a national forum for Quaker worship during uh, COVID. And holding in light is a common phrase uh, mm. among that group. And this also came up. And so we contemplated for a while and decided on uh, holding in love instead of holding in the light. But now as I'm hearing this, I'm thinking, well, it, it just, it's, it's working. But I had wanted to say um, just how helpful it is. You're talking about the Dalai Lama and the moving of the body around and the mm -hmm. chest going up. And I know you and Chandra do those practices with us, but I've just really been thinking the, um, experiencing really I went to my first concert last uh, week in since COVID started and I watched this conductor from um, from the Czech Republic from whatever Czechoslovakia is called now. <laughs> anyway it was just beautiful the orchestra and everything and it was like a practice mm -hmm. like a Buddhist practice and I went today to a mass in honor of a friend for the mm. first time uh, in many decades. And um, I watched the singing and, and the priest and the way they moved their chest up. And I felt mm -hmm. my body responding through the practices that I've been doing with you all. And it was like, suddenly I could carry this practice in so many different ways. It keeps opening and opening. So I don't, mm. I don't know why I needed to share that tonight, but I'll Put it there. So hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I, and thank you for sharing about the, the work with the Quaker um, circle, such, such beautiful work. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with the Quaker practice, it's really such wonderful alignment with the Dharma too. And, you know, how we can all work together to create spaces of, of healing and that words really matter words matter so much, right? We speak them, they kind of start to define how we see ourselves and how we see others. Um, and it, and I love that kind of the calibration of our body, right? You know, I, it's, it's just amazing to really tune in and get, you know, more and more refined at a granular level with, with the body. Um, cause we do start to experience everything in a different way. And I love you bring up music. Um, you know, I've been thinking about awe again recently, as is often the case. Um, I did a little teaching on awe this weekend and, you know, of course the natural world, but music, birth, death, all these incredible events that give us a sense of vastness. And we have that sense of vastness. It is a psychological experience, but it's embodied. So thank you for pointing that out. Yeah. Any other thoughts, reflections, pontifications, prose uh, about practice before we move on? Okay. Back to the story. So we are now, there's this, yeah, there's this kind of, um, this interesting uh, little aspect right before the Buddha leaves the children. For, so for those of you who, who haven't been here last week or in a while, the Buddha woke up. It's a really big deal. Very beautiful. 
clear, deep, clear seeing. Um, and he, you know, has been kind of sustained for these months that he's been, you know, or I guess it was really just a number of weeks when he realized, oh, wow, I am on my way to the next phase of realization. Like he had a real sense of it. And he decided to stay by the river, by this tree. And these children from the local village were sustaining him, you know, bringing offerings, um, including the grass that he sat on. This is from this Buffalo boy who's a protagonist in the story here. And also, you know, rice and milk. And then Buddha also treats these children like his first disciples and thinks, if I can explain these teachings to these country children, I can explain these to anybody. And so he, um, you know, gathers them and has them really start understanding and thinking about bringing mindfulness into their everyday life, into their eating, into their um, experiencing together. And then there's this really, this sweet little story here. I, I'm, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but give you um, a bit of the overview where, you know, so this whole group of children who come and uh, one of the days when the children come, two of the children are in a fight with each other. Right. And they're just like not getting along. Very human behavior, unfortunately. And they uh, they asked the Buddha, can you tell us a story about friendship? Kind of a way to invite the Buddha into these to their very important issues, which is like, I don't like this person right now. Usually they're my best friend, but now I don't like them. And it's interesting because the Buddha decides to tell um, a story of him in a past life. And we were talking about last week how a lot of this story is is really free from kind of anything magical or even too metaphysical. And yet there are these sprinklings um, that I think are so beautiful of the fact that part of the Buddha waking up was an ability to see and recognize all past lives. No requirement that anybody here believes in past lives. It's okay if you don't. But I, as I was mentioning last week, there's so much we don't know about consciousness. It's really worth considering that we might not know everything, right? Uh, for example, I mentioned that idea of you think of someone and then they text you. And that happens quite a lot. It's a usual phenomena that we don't understand. Also, just the whole world of dreams. Kind of amazing. Sometimes, you know, we dream really beautiful, vivid things that we don't quite understand. So whether you want to think of uh, these as, as a story or something that the Buddha is actually able to do, um, he has this beautiful thing in which he, um, he describes and says that uh, he, he very much can see into his past lives. Um, he says, in previous lives, we have all been earth, stones, dew, wind, water, and fire. We have been mosses, grasses, trees, insects, fish, turtles, birds, and mammals. I've seen this clearly in my meditations. Maybe picturing myself as another human, picturing myself as moss, that usually hasn't occurred to me in a past life. I just think it's fun to entertain uh, that possibility of how many different constituent factors could have led to us as we are now. And he said that in this past life, he's talking about that he was a deer and his closest friends were a turtle and a crow. And they all lived alongside this pond and a hunter came and the hunter set a trap for the deer. And uh, before that, the crow could warn the deer, the deer stepped in it. And so the turtle went to start kind of trying to chew the ropes of the, of the, trap so that the deer could get free and the crow went to wait outside the hunter's house and when the hunter left the house he came and flapped in the hunter's face and the hunter was like what the and like went back inside the hunter tried to go out the back door and the crow came again and he's like okay inauspicious day to go i will stay inside and so the little turtle chewed all night and got like bloody in his jaws and then the hunter was coming and the crow was trying to caw and just as he could, just as the hunter was coming, the deer kicked the trap free and the turtle went into, um, was trying to get into the water and the hunter took the turtle and put it in his bag and went to chase the deer. 
So then the deer does a wonderful kind of fake out as though the deer is injured and the hunter comes to get them. And then the deer comes back around, gets the turtle free, happily all these little beings in this case, you know, they have a really nice happy outcome, not always the case. And the story is meant to illustrate the power of friendship. And the Buddha then says, who in a past life was the turtle who helped me get free? Who was the crow who helped me get free? And all the children raise their hand, of course, for both. It's, you know, maybe less, um, less sense of already knowing from these children. And when the children realize that they could have in another time saved each other's lives or been friends, that reminded them that they should make up and love each other. Just, it's sweet. You know, it's interesting. You definitely wouldn't get away with teaching that in a secular school these days. <laughs> um, but I love, and you'll, and throughout the book, he will always take time to stop and tell stories to the children. And very often tell these stories of past lives and experiences where um, people really cared for one another, people and other beings cared for one another. An interesting part of this um, of this book, and it's it's interesting to think, you know, with Thich Nhat Han, he he didn't make any of these up. These are the fragments of stories that survived for thousands of years. So I can only imagine that this was a story that was really useful for kids in small villages. That this is sustained, you know, of all the stories, because that there was kind of some sense of this has a teaching utility. To be honest, it doesn't have this big impact on me, but I didn't want to prevent you all from hearing it in case it has a big impact on you. And if it does, you please let me know. Um, other than it's very sweet to think of these stories of friendship. The the next part. Um, of the book here, it gets into a really simple, but really profound point. And it's, it happens as, as many cases in, in the book and where we are now is we get to start seeing how the Buddha develops what becomes Buddhism just through his observation of daily life. And in this case, he's walking along the river and looking at a pond. And when he looks at the pond, he sees all these beautiful different color of lotus. As he looked at the lotus stems and flowers, he thought of all the different stages of a lotus growth. The roots remained buried in mud. Some stems had not risen above the surface of the water. Others had barely emerged to reveal that the leaves were still cur curled tightly shut. They were unopened lotus flower buds, those with petals just beginning to peek out, and some with full bloom. There were seed pods from which already the petals had fallen. There were white lotus, blue ones, pink ones. And the Buddha reflected that people were not different from lotus flowers. Each person had his or her own natural disposition. Devadatta was not like Ananda. Yasodhara was not the same as Queen Pamita. Sujata was not like Bala. Personality, virtue, intelligence, and talent varied widely among people. The path of liberation which the Buddha had discovered needed to be expounded in many ways to suit many kinds of people. Teaching the village children was so pleasant, he thought, because he could speak to them in such a simple way. Different teaching methods were like gates by which different kinds of people could enter and understand the teachings. The creation of the Dharma gates would result from direct encounters with people. There were no ready-made methods miraculously received under the Bodhi tree. The Buddha saw that it would be necessary to return to society in order to set the wheel of Dharma in motion to sow the seeds of liberation. And I just, I love this idea that, you know, he recognizes very early just through seeing the natural differences in the world that we are all different and in different phases or stages, right? In which we're able to receive teachings and that these teachings might need to reach us in different ways. I was fortunate to be at this big contemplative science conference a couple of weeks ago. And one of the key takeaways at this conference is people teaching in hospitals, teaching in clinics, teaching in with youth and in, every single different arena that you need to modify the teachings to meet the needs of the people. And it's really interesting. There's a case of a very large study, a very well-funded study. I might've mentioned it here. It spent millions of dollars evaluating mindfulness in a school setting. 
And it took five years, and the outcome was that mindfulness doesn't help children. And uh, it's surprising since uh, so many other studies have demonstrated it. But I think it's also a study that helps us see how important it is to get buy-in because none of the kids liked the intervention. And anyone who's taught mindfulness to kids knows a lot of ways to make it enjoyable and engaging. And so this, you know, it's so important to remember that we actually have to shift the practice and make it um, meet us. I think it's also a good time to recognize that um, often when I'm teaching here with you all, I, I'll hear folks say in the meditation, like, ah, oh, I wanted to focus on what you were saying, but something else was going on for me. And I hope I often emphasize, you know, I'm offering one thing, but truly the goal is that you have your own like apothecary of practices and you choose them as you need them. Whatever is on offer here tonight, it might meet what you need, but often it really is going to have to be choosing, starting to familiarize ourselves with practices and knowing what we need. So I just, I really love that. Um, that part. And he also saw that he couldn't just, you know, write a book and by the river and kind of send it out, that he'd need to go into the world and meet people and that he would learn and the practices would unfold through meeting others. Um, so I think it's, yeah, just really, really sweet to see that. And you know, his first, his first disciples is he wants to go find his friends. So as some of you may remember, he was practicing with five others and they'd left uh, Master um, said Alara, I think, or Udaka to go practice on their own. And they decided that the most important way to practice was self-mortification. In order to wake up, they had to not eat, barely drink any water, you know, really get austerity to the body because the life of the spirit would come. And the Buddha was almost on the verge of pretty much um, death, right? When he realized too much, too austere. And he found what he calls the middle way, not indulging in luxuries so that you're so kind of stupefied that you can't actually receive the teachings, but not so austere that you have no energy and vitality for the teachings. And you miss out on that lift of the heart from the world. You know, you're trying to deny the world and you're losing that lift and that beauty, that natural reward. So he wants, so his friends saw him, you know, eating and, you know, starting to no longer do these practices of such austerity. And they're like, he is weak. We can't trust that guy anymore. We're out of here. And the Buddha saw them go and he's like, I'm going to let them go. No, I'll come back. So his first thought is I got to get back to my friends um, and give them the teaching. And there's this really funny moment when, you know, his friends, these five friends, they see him coming and they're like, that guy who gave up on self-mortification, we're going to, we're going to snub him. When he comes in to meet us, we're not even going to go or greet him at all. Like, we'll just let him come to us. And then as the Buddha is walking in to where his friends are practicing in this forest, all of them are like, <laughs> there's literally, I think it's described as um, Siddhartha seemed to be surrounded by an aura of light. Each step he took revealed a rare spiritual strength. His penetrating gaze undermined their intentions to snub him. So they run up and like someone gives him a footstool, someone gives him water, someone starts fanning him and the other is like, I don't even know what to do. Uh, they're like so excited. Um, there's just such a sense of, wow, this, this being is coming with what I need with these clear teachings and um, just so beautiful, right? That he says, the path I've discovered is the middle way. It avoids the extremes and has the capacity to lead one to understanding, liberation and peace. He says, I call this the right path. And I call it that because it does not avoid or deny suffering. It allows for a direct confrontation with suffering as the means to overcome it so beautiful allows for a direct confrontation with suffering as the means to overcome it not distracting right so we remember when he was sitting with his other teachers and they gave him these incredible practices in which he could transcend he felt spacious awareness he was in realms beyond realms beyond realms but then he came back and he was still him and there was still 
the everyday anxieties and frustrations and worries. And he realized I can't go out there to solve what needs to be met right here. Um, he said, uh, it allows for suffering as the means to overcome it. It's the path of living awareness. Mindfulness is the foundation. By practicing mindfulness, you can develop concentration and it enables you to attain understanding. Thanks to right concentration, you realize awareness of thoughts, speech, and action, livelihood, and effort. The understanding which develops can liberate you from every shackle of suffering and give birth to peace and joy. And then here we get the first of the Four Noble Truths. This is, this excite those Buddhist nerds among us. You're like, oh my God, it's the first. Of that. So the first time he teaches the Four Noble Truths, the existence of suffering, the cause of suffering, and the cessation of suffering, and the path which leads to the cessation of suffering. It's just, it's so beautiful to see that this is truly the foundation of what he's teaching. For many of us in the room, maybe the, the Four Noble Truths might have been the first things we heard or were taught. Um, and kind of going back and, and really considering, you know, how transformative uh, these simple practices are. He says, the first is the existence of suffering. Birth, old age, sickness, and death are suffering. Sadness, anger, jealousy, worry, fear, and despair are also suffering. Separation from loved ones is suffering. Association from those you association with those you hate is suffering. Desire, attachment, and clinging are also suffering. The second truth is the cause of suffering. It's because of ignorance, not knowing, that people can't see the truth about life and they become caught in the flames of desire, anger, jealousy, grief, worry, fear, and despair. And the third truth is the cessation or that there can be an end of suffering. If we understand the truth of life, it will bring about the cessation of every grief and sorrow and give rise to peace and joy. Hmm. The third truth is the cessation of suffering, that the, the understanding of the truth of life brings about the cessation of every grief and sorrow and gives rise to peace and joy. So I, I just think it's, um, yeah, so powerful to reflect on that, that our deep understanding or seeing things clearly could really alleviate our suffering. And I'd love to hear from folks, like, what do those mean to you? What do the Four Noble Truths mean to you? Maybe it's the first time you've heard them, maybe the millionth time. But with a beginner's mind, like, what does this mean? How can we use it? How can we understand it? It's a total pop quiz. Yes. Do you mind speaking to the mic? No. Thank you. I was just thinking that um, without a real understanding of the Dharma and the teachings, um, the four noble truths or at least maybe the first three could you could make the conclusion that life sucks then you die <laughs> yeah i mean um and i think that that for me when i was first exposed to buddhism that um that that's where i kind of got stuck yeah you know and i think that's why uh uh still a lot of people uh um view Buddhism as a fatalistic yeah. and depressing um, spiritual path. Yeah. 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 Uh, anyway, that's all. How about, how about now though? <laughs> Life still sucks. <laughs> but now you understand it. But now I understand. <laughs> That's good. We should almost drop the mic on that one. That's <laughs> Anybody else or a question? Like, what are these noble truths? How, how do we actually, how does understanding help us? Like, why? What about it? 
Yes, please. So kind of to that point of like life sucks and then you die. <laughs> my interpretation of that is actually you're basically setting a baseline for our existence or our, our reality here such that because that's the baseline, anything that is good is therefore a bonus. <laughs> and the way I see it is it is for me, the conduit for gratitude, mm. you know, it could always be worse mm. at any point. And so with the frame of mind of this is none of this is guaranteed. Mm. None of this is owed. Everything is a blessing. Everything's gratitude. I think that helps at least me personally, mm. um, you know, appreciate and then have the joy yeah. as Buddha Buddha says. So that's kind of how I saw it when I first heard about it. I was like, oh, that actually makes a lot of sense. Mm. You know, so yeah. Thank you. Beautiful. Yeah. And I do think nihilism can't coexist with gratitude. So that um I'll think about that more, but I don't think it can. And and that sense as you're describing of receiving essentially like the blessings right of the world as opposed to expecting and i think a lot of you know we talked a couple of weeks back about like what do we mean by this word ignorance that comes up so much a lot of it is expectation oh it should be this way it should be this way for me and that creates so much suffering right this expectation jimmy i saw your hand over there Tell us about the noble truth. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, I really echo and I resonate and want to echo what's been said already about, you know, life sucks, but the, the, the contrast is that when some good shit happens, it's, it's really cool because <laughs> life basically sucks. Um, that's really true for me, but that isn't enough when I'm suffering. Yeah. So understanding my suffering on a, case by case basis and having a sort of a general understanding of my suffering being caused by my holding on to my expectations or my bringing in some really strange or um some 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 sort of projection of something that's happened in the past or some confusion or delusion I have about the situation, whatever it may be. And just to understand that that's possible, hmm. that what I'm suffering over may really have more to do with what I'm bringing into the situation than the situation actually is. Um, and when I have when I understand that and I have a clear picture of that, again, on a case by case basis, it's easier for me to um, to accept the situation and not suffer so much mm -hmm. around it. And to I usually feel a little bit better about whatever is going on when I understand how I'm adding to it and I can kind of back away from from that because it's you know it's it's I get this sense of <laughs> well, silly old me bringing that shit into the game again <laughs> and you know this 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 is you know this ain't nothing new yeah um so it's it yeah I, I, understanding my suffering on a case-by-case -case basis is is important in alleviating um, the, 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 the suffering that I experience. Right. Yeah. Beautiful. And, you know, I think you're describing too, when we externalize the source of our suffering, boy, do we get in trouble, right? <laughs> then we're blaming, we're looking for someone else to blame. And it really, it creates so much more suffering, 
Um, and, and also, you know, Walt, right, without the force, noble truth of there is a path, right? And the path delineates how we can be, you know, in right relationship or wholesome with how we're thinking and speaking and acting and being in the world. So there's, you know, there is happily like a strategy and a map. Um, and we can, we'll get more into this next week. Um, but I think it's, it's so beautiful to, again, like kind of start at the beginning. The Four Noble Truths are, are so misunderstood. Um, and I think, you know, may inadvertently project a sense of total like morbidness when in fact they can offer us so much freedom really interesting like the reality of suffering as being actually truly um something that can make us feel joyful and free just when i can remember the first jumble through us i can feel freedom that i'm not doing something wrong right i'm not suffering because i fucked up just like oh yeah right dukkha yes exactly right it feels less personal yeah yeah, and that, you know, um, it's so easy, especially in our contemporary um, modern culture, to lose sight of sickness, old age, um, and uh, um, you, you, or you can at least lose sight that it'll happen to you. It kind of <laughs> happens over there, not here. So, yeah, very powerful. Um, let's take a moment and, and dedicate the merit together. So really bringing back a sense of presence in our body, in our breath. And in this time of our experience together, we really get to dedicate and share this aspiration and intention that these teachings could be transformative for us but that they could ripple out, radiate out, and be in service with the outrageous and beautiful hope that all beings could be free, all beings could be healthy and strong, all beings could find the meaningful and lasting sources of happiness, all beings could be free. Thank you for your practice. A couple announcements um, for friends online and in person. Oh, I see Coco. Hi. Oh, she's so cute. Um, so a reminder that, of course, we are here out of generosity, and that includes you all. So we're at a moment in the Dharma Collective where I think we might have lost our way a bit with the donations. Um, I got a chance to talk to the board who, again, I appreciate so much for their effort at helping us be here together out of totally their own energy and spirit. And I think we've had a, a pretty steep decline in donations. Um, and it might just be like, my guess is it's hard for us to remember and to keep in mind that this space is freely available for us if we don't have the means to donate, but also if we are able to donate, it helps us keep it alive and move it forward and keep it space open for, for everyone. Um, myself as a teacher here, um, I'm really trying to figure out ways to also support the center more. And I just really um, encourage you to, if you can, do the monthly donorship, which really helps folks anticipate what will happen in terms of um, annual income or sorry, monthly income and keeping the doors open. I got to meet the uh, landlord here. She's really awesome. Um, and she's still charging San Francisco rent. Um, she was very nice, very accommodating. I was like, how about that? Like big discount. Like, 
Still not yet. So really appreciate your support and your help um, as we find new ways to make sure we keep the center open. Um, so thank you for that. Next Wednesday, we'll do the happiness hour. So bring your burrito, torta, you know, pizza, uh, come an hour early, hang out, chat with one another. Last time it was so fun. Uh, bring your friends.